Well, good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Billy Glisson. Um, life has a funny way of, of things working out because 22 years ago, I was sitting with a guy by the name of Jim Murray, who's the executive director now at Front Range Volleyball. And he was sitting with me talking to me about why he should hire someone to teach him how to train his volleyball players when I, in fact, had never coached, never played volleyball in my life. So why on earth would he hire me to do that? And my response was real quick and, and real brief. It was like, because, because I don't bring the biases. I don't bring things that you've heard in volleyball. I'm a science guy. Uh, undergrad was in teaching and coaching, master's degree in exercise science. I'm a strength conditioning coach, but I'm really a science guy. And so my response to him was, look, I'm going to look at your players' movements, and that's what I'm really good at. If you show me the movement, I'll show you how to train it, and I'll show you how to train it in a way they'll jump higher, move faster, hit harder, and avoid injury at the same time. Um, those of you, and I know there's people here that know me that are worked with us or worked with me, uh, I'm not a follower. The stuff I do is pretty much out of the box, but it's all very much science-based. Um, I worked with Front Range for 21 years. I wrote all their strength conditioning programs, and that's where actually Power Core actually started probably four or five years into it. Um, in my tenure with them, a few years into it, I met Terry Pettit, who um, is now a Hall of Fame coach from formerly from the University of Nebraska. And in 2019, um, right before COVID hit, I had reached out to Terry and I said, Terry, um, something has to be done with volleyball swings because we're getting contacted. We're running clinics, but I'm getting contacted all the time by parents, a lot of females that had played high level volleyball. And now their shoulders are torn up some in, in some cases permanently. And they don't want they when they come to our clinics, probably a third of the people that come to our power hitting clinics are there in terms of parents, they just don't want their athlete to get hurt. Yeah, they want them to hit harder and play more and do all that stuff, but they don't want to have them tear up their shoulders. Well, Terry told me, Billy, I support it. The problem is college coaches are inheriting bad swings and bad shoulders. And I know this because I've worked with a lot of college coaches um, and some of which I can tell you have been really honest with me to say, they don't really train in college a lot, right? I mean, they, they don't develop athletes Athletes get there, that's like the playing grounds, right? So they train to get in shape, but more importantly, they're there. The, the swings they come to college with have been developed elsewhere. And that's the segue into clubs and high schools um, are, are obviously the training grounds for a lot of arm swings. And in some cases, uh, shoulders are being damaged. And I would suggest to you, a lot of shoulders are being damaged. In some cases, like I said, permanently. The purpose of today is to inform you. I'm a, I'm a teacher, I'm an educator. Uh, and first and foremost, that's what I'm trying to have. I'm, I'm trying to change the game. Um, John Dunning from Stanford said to me about probably 10 years to go, uh, ago at a, uh, a tournament. And he said to me, Billy, you're trying to change the game. And I said, well, that wasn't really my intent. I'm an educator. I'm a teacher. Uh, I know the science. I know the body. And so I'm just trying to help people train athletes, volleyball hitters in this case, to teach them to hit harder, but not tear up their shoulder and back in the process. I met a guy by the name of Mike Bard. Mike Bard is, is in the Denver area. He trains major league baseball players. And when I met him, we, I had, he gave me 10 minutes. He was, I was recommended to go talk to him. And, you know, there's a guy that's worked with major league baseball players. This was 10 or 11 years ago. And on the phone, he says, I'll give you 10 minutes, right? Well, two hours later, I walked out from a discussion with him. The real point with Mike Bard was he said to me, you know, Billy, when we were talking about the mechanics of hitting and pitching in baseball, he said, the problem is a lot of coaches and athletes and everybody else are parrots. They repeat what they've heard. And so I'm going to suggest to you, I, I don't support parrots. I don't like parrots. I'm a lifetime learner. And that's what I'm hoping you are, because in my opinion, it's everyone's responsibility. If you're a coach, a trainer, whatever your profession is or forte, it's about if we're working with young athletes, young hitters, um, they're whiteboards and they're going to listen to everything we say. And it, in, in my opinion, hopefully today we're going to provide some information, some education in terms of how the shoulder really works. We are going to get into some anatomy because if you don't understand the anatomy and physiology of the shoulder, you, you don't really have any basis to make the decisions you're making in terms of the mechanics you're teaching. So anyway, um, I'm hoping today that we're going to impart some knowledge to you guys um, and ultimately, we're trying to make athletes hit the ball harder for you guys to win more games, more matches, all that great stuff. But in the big picture, long term, 
every athlete I've ever trained, it's always been dual function. Yeah, I'm going to make you better, faster, stronger, whatever the case is, but I've always got an eye on their health long term, not just getting through their club or high school or college or even pro career, but, you know, I'm about to turn 66 next week and I want athletes to be able when they're 66 to still go out and be active. So um, that's it. That's, that's my background. Today, working with me, Kelly Fiesler is a physical therapist. She's also a strength coach. She's got 25 years of clinical experience treating musicians, treating athletes, treating others. Um, she's a strength conditioning coach as well. And also she's a co-director of a volleyball club in Cleveland. So it's not her first dance or rodeo treating shoulders. And she understands the, the challenges that happens in clubs. She understands the stresses of that. With her is going to be Jess. Jess is a high school athlete, probably just graduated on her way to play college volleyball. Um, you guys will meet them in just a few minutes, but they're going to give you um, a breakdown of the applied anatomy of the shoulder and, and give you visually some understanding to help you make better decisions in terms of the mechanics you're teaching and training. Uh, Nicole Edelman is, you can see her wave at him, Nicole. Um, Nicole, I met from Front Range Volleyball Club. She played there years ago. Um, she went on to the University of Colorado, was a Pac-12 All-American, set her hitter. Um, at University of Colorado, um, Nicole herniated a couple discs in her low back. And, you know, you never know who you're dealing with. You know, I knew Nicole. I knew she was a great competitor. I really liked her as an athlete. But then I actually went to the game against Stanford and she could hardly pick up her foot. But yet she was still... Um, forcing herself through the game and then a few weeks later her mom called me and I'd never met her mom but she's also a physical therapist in Boulder and asked me if I would help rehab um, with the physical therapist that was doing the, the, the treatment for her and help get her back from rehab PT onto the court so University of Colorado allowed me to go in and work with Nicole and their athletic trainer and She's a smart cookie. Nicole helps us every year. And, and when she's in the off season, not playing overseas, um, she helps us run clinics. And today she's behind the controls, uh, letting you guys in. So anyway, welcome to you, all of you guys. I'm going to jump in and I'm going to get into and, and I'm going to tell you some things. And then very quickly, I know how people learn. We know how athletes learn. Predominantly, they learn visually and they learn by feel. But I am going to give you a little bit. I'm going to show you some high level athletes you're going to know. And I'm going to suggest to you that these three things are similarities. And we talk about overhead athletes. That's an athlete who either throws or hits overhead. I'm going to show you in just a minute some examples of how the body works. And then specifically, we'll get into the shoulder. Three things happen with good mechanics, um, because what I do is I work with athletes. and I teach them how to hit, throw, kick, punch harder. And once again, protect their body from injury in the process. I'm going to suggest to you that these three things happen, and these are three things you ought to be looking for in teaching um, as you're working with your volleyball athletes, your volleyball hitters. Number one, there is a, either a step or a weight shift, and visually, I'll walk you through these things. In parentheses, I'm going to show you a couple of things that you should be looking for, right? If you want more arm speed, more ball speed, if you want to terminate better, if you want to win, score more points, and protect the athlete, the spine's going to tilt backwards, and the shoulders are going to tilt up. I'm going to show you that in a minute. The body is going to turn. It is not just an arm swing, but yet so many young athletes come to us and they walk into a clinic or to the gym and they swing their arm and their body doesn't move. And I'll show you in just a minute, that's not the case. That's not what we should be teaching. That's not the best way to, you'll hear this from me today, generate and tolerate shoulder torque or back torque. Uh, follow through. This is going, if you came up through traditional volleyball, um, the right hand finishes to the left hip pocket. And you're probably saying, oh, no, it doesn't. Well, I'm going to show you how the other athletes and the other sports do it. And I'm going to ask mm -hmm. you, and then Kelly will get into maybe why that's important that the right hand does actually go to the left hip pocket. When we get into the shoulder itself, um, we're going to talk about the right elbow being at or below the shoulder line. Visually, I'll show you this. When the athlete starts to hit the ball, the left shoulder is going to actually drop and the elbow is going to come up. And if you haven't figured it out thus far, we're going to be talking about the high elbow swing because that's predominantly what's being taught across the country. And the high elbow swing is actually creating issues, creating damage um, for a lot of these athletes. The last thing, the right hand, as we've just said, and the follow through is going to go to the left pocket. Well, that's all. Those are all great words. 
but now let's get into some visuals. This is a guy that everybody knows. This is the goat in football. This is Tom Brady and, and the, the picture's a little blurry, but you'll see the things that I want you to see. This is him and his alma mater at Michigan a couple of years ago. He's throwing the ball before a Michigan football game. And the first thing I'm gonna tell you, I'll reinforce once again, is there's always a step. When an athlete is gonna hit, throw, kick or punch and they're trying to maximize their force, their power, their arm speed, the ball speed, whatever the case may be, there's always gonna be either a step or a weight shift. In football, there's a step as a quarterback. When they step, the head is actually going to stay back. It's the lower half of the body. If you cut his body in half, you're gonna watch his, as he takes a step with his left foot towards the target, his hips, legs, and lower body are gonna move forward. And it actually creates uh, what we call a spine angle, right? The blue line there indicates his, his spine's actually tilted back. And when we talk about positions, just to keep it simple, we're gonna talk about when the arm and the ball come up, right? One of the things I'm gonna to mention to you right now is the high elbow arm swing is really about lifting the elbow up high first. And that's, that's not the best way to do this. I'll walk you through it. <clears throat> when the step happens and the lower half goes forwards, there's a sh what we're gonna call a shoulder line there indicated by the yellow line. If we take a stick, a dowel, anything, and we stick it over the top of the shoulders. If you look at Tom Brady or any other quarterback trying to create a powerful throw, we're not talking about a five yard throw, right? That could just be a flick of the wrist. We're talking about he's trying to throw the ball 40, 50, 60 yards, maximizing power, arm speed, and ultimately ball speed and distance. We create that shoulder line. And that shoulder line is indicated there. Once again, if you took a stick and run it through the, the tops of the two shoulders, what I want you to notice is, is the arm and ball comes up. The elbow doesn't come up above that line first. The hand, the ball comes up above that line and the elbow stays down. And that's critical. That's critical for football. The follow through, this is Brady throwing and here's watch his right hand. His right hand is going to his left hip pocket. There's a reason. Kelly will talk about some of that. We'll talk through that. This is from the back view. Once again, Brady throwing. There's the shoulder line. Notice that once again, the ball and hand are starting to come up above that shoulder line first. The elbow is staying below that shoulder line. The spine's actually tilted to his left. So one of the ways that we, if I go back a frame and we keep, when we keep this upper arm here, the right arm in this case, below that shoulder line, the only way we can really do that is if there's actually a tilt to the body that the spine actually tilts to the left. So the hips, the pelvis and shoulders are all uh, moving to the left here as he starts to release the ball. All right, let's go into Major League Baseball. Arnaldus Chapman throws the ball over 100 miles an hour, right? Probably the most velocity in the game. This is his ready position. The next thing that's gonna happen, we, step, we said there's always gonna be a step, a weight shift, or in baseball terminology, there's a stride that happens. His lower half moves forward. If I drew the blue line back on there, you'd actually see that his, his head staying back, his spine is tilted backwards, and that creates the shoulder line. As he starts to bring his arm up, once again, the elbow is gonna stay down below that shoulder line and the hand and ball are gonna come up first above that shoulder line. There's the shoulder line. You really can't see it. His arm is up at the top. His arm is externally rotated, left-handed pitcher in this case, and his arm is way back, but his arm and hand and ball, everything's behind that shoulder line. And if you were looking from second base view at this guy, you'd see that his elbow is below that shoulder line. The ball and hand are going to come up above it, but initially until he starts to actually throw the hand and ball are staying below that as his body starts to turn. And when we start talking about the turn, I'm gonna introduce the concept that the, the body turns in a very specific way. We start with that step and then the hips turn first and then the turn of the hips turns the shoulders and the turn of the body creates arm whip, right? So you can't see it here very well. You'll see it better in some of the other sports, but the turn of the body uses big muscles. It creates all kinds of what we call rotational power or arm whip and then the arm comes through. The arm is active. It's not, we're, we're not dragging the arm through the muscles of the shoulder, the rotator cuff, the arm. They are working, but they're working in addition with the turn of the body, the big muscles. The follow through. 
Once again, we've got a guy throwing 100 miles an hour high velocity uh, on the ball. Look where his hand goes. In this case, he's a lefty. His hand's going to his opposite hip pocket. That's the follow through. It's doing that not because probably someone taught him how to do it. That's what we're teaching young athletes and coaches is to understand this is what we ought to be teaching athletes is there is a step, there is a weight shift, there's a body turn, and then there's a follow through that should happen on power swings, on power attacks. Now let's go to Andy Roddick. Andy Roddick is now retired, but when he was playing, he would hit the ball in tennis on his serves 150 miles an hour, right? Probably the highest velocity tennis player who's ever played in the game. Same things, here's his ready position. In, in tennis, in this case, they're not so much a step, but there is a weight shift from his back leg to his front leg. Most importantly, there's the shoulder line once again, and notice that the racket and hand are coming up above the line and the elbow staying below that line. Kelly will get into the reasons why that's important. Once again, we're talking about how do you generate and tolerate arm speed, ball speed, right? How do you hit harder, but how do you protect the, the athlete's back in the pro, excuse me, shoulder in the process? As he starts to turn his hips, turn his chest, create that arm whip. And once again, there's the shoulder line and we didn't bring that elbow up above that shoulder line first. The racket, the hand came up above it first. Follow through. Andy Roddick takes after he swings as a right-hander, look, so look where his right hand goes, left hip pocket. Good reason why he does that. All right, let's move forward into volleyball because you might be sitting there saying, well, this is all great. Those are other sports, but volleyball is different. I'm going to suggest to you the anatomy of the shoulder, the physiology of the body is no different, doesn't matter what sport you're playing. But in this case, I will suggest to you that one of the things when we run clinics, oftentimes we'll show a volleyball player like, excuse me, a tennis athlete like Andy Roddick, because the motion of hitting a volleyball overhead and hitting a tennis ball like a serve or smash are almost identical. Here's Matt Anderson from the U.S. men's Olympic team, and, and he just flat brings it. He crushes the ball, and what I want you to notice, he's in the air in that ready position. Here's the shoulder line. What comes up first? His hand and, and arm comes up above the, sh the shoulder line first. His elbow's below it. This is that arm up position. His body starts to turn. His feet kick. His hips turn. His chest turns. There's the shoulder line. Oh, now the elbow's a little bit above it. Great, it is gonna come a little bit above it. But one of the things Kelly's gonna get into is something's happening with the right shoulder blade to allow Matt Anderson, to allow all these other guys or girls, doesn't matter the gender, to keep their shoulder healthy. Even though the elbow's coming up, it's not coming up early. It's not a high elbow early. It's a high elbow coming up after the hips have turned, after the chest has turned, but something's happening with that right shoulder blade to protect the shoulder to allow them to hit hard and tolerate hitting hard. Here's the follow through. I know it's blurry, but look at the right hand. The right hand's going to, guess what? Left hip pocket. Kelly's going to jump in and Kelly and Jess are going to walk you guys through some anatomy, some applied anatomy in the shoulder and visually uh, give you an indication of what's going on and be able to, to for her to talk through that. This is and this is Jess. Mary. So we already have to give us so we're just going to get started. So what I'm going to talk with you and show you is today is I'm going to use what Billy just went through with you and I'm going to reiterate it from an anatomical and a kinesiological standpoint. Anatomy, everyone knows what that word means. Kinesiology is a study of movement. So we're going to go through um, the arm mechanics, the shoulder line, the neutral shoulder versus high elbow, why it's bad if your elbow is high, and, and how do we keep our shoulder uh, in a neutral position and why that is good for your shoulder, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is, I'm gonna reiterate that shoulder uh, line on Jess. So Jess is gonna go ahead and turn. Great. And so what I want you to see is that shoulder line that Bill was talking about showed in the video is up here. And you can see with Jess, her shoulder blades are on her back. Right? I'm going to grab my shoulder blade to show you. So here's the shoulder line. And this is a scapula. Um, this is the collarbone. If 
be in the front side of the upper body. So this is the scapula, okay? And it sits on your mat like that, okay? And you can see Jess's shoulder blade is on her back versus away from her spine, okay? And so what I want to show you now is the relationship to the upper arm bone, right? This is your upper arm bone, and this is your shoulder blade. I'm not going to, um, I'm just going to assume everyone's right right now. So I'm going to take your left hand and I want you to find a big device at the squeeze. And you're going to go up your bicep up until you hit that ball at the top. That ball at the top is the, what's called the humeral head. It's the ball at the top of your arm. Okay. As you go up to the ball, now I want you to go over the top where you feel a little ridge at the top. It's kind of like a root. That roof is part of the shoulder blade. It's called the, um, I write just on blank for a second. It's called the um, chromium process, and it's the roof of your shoulder blade. So you have your shoulder blade and you have the upper arm bone, and they come together like that, okay? That upper arm bone, that ball, sits on this round surface right over here called the shoulder blade. It's called the glenoid. But it sits right there, right in the middle. The important piece is that this stays in the middle of that process the entire time we're going to hit the ball until after we make contact. Okay, so this is what it looks like on Jess. So go ahead and turn Jess for me. Hey, Kelly. Uh, yes. Can you get a little closer? The audio, for whatever reason, is a little bad. Can you get cl as close as you can sure. to the camera? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that better? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. So this is what the shoulder blade looks like on your back. This is the upper arm bone. This is a, just as a right-handed hitter, this is a right-sided scapula and shoulder. So the arm bone fits in there just like that. And I'm hoping that you can see Jess turn towards me a little bit. The space right now between the arm bone and that roof of the shoulder blade, okay? This sits in the center of that fossa and it keeps the space there. That space is very important because all of the tissues of your rotator cuff muscles, and I know you've all heard about those, all of those tissues have to sit underneath um, the roof and they are on top of the arm bone, and they have to be able to pass through there as your arm goes overhead, okay? So that's the relationship and what it should look like. So can you show, Kelly, take your index finger there and show where the supraspinatus comes through that gap? Right here. Yeah. So I'm going to have Jess turn a tiny bit. This area right here on the bone is where that supraspinatus that we all hear about people injuring um, whether it's tendonitis or actually having a tear, it sits there and it comes, the tendon of that muscle comes through here and has to rest right underneath the roof of that shoulder between the upper arm bone and the roof of the shoulder, okay? So spacing there is very important. All right, now what I wanna show you is um, when you, lose that spacing and why you lose that spacing. So I would like to have everybody um, go ahead, you're probably sitting, which is fine. I want you to sit up nice and tall like Jess is. And hopefully you can get your shoulder blades just gently on your back, just like Jess. She's not squeezing hard, so go ahead and squeeze Jess. She's not squeezing. Hers just rests right where you're supposed to be naturally. So now what I'm going to have Jess do is she's going to go into that texting position, right? Not blaming you for being in this position, but we're in this position a lot. And what you can see has happened, Jess's shoulder blade has now slid away from her spine. And lift your hands up a little bit. And uh, like so much more. And it's now lifted up more towards here. So her shoulder blade just went like this. So it's away from the spine. It's tipped forward and, and anteriorly or forward tipped, okay? What happens there? So when Jess is in this texting position, what's going to happen is the arm bone now sits much 
So I'm gonna keep her arm bone where it is and I'm just changing the shoulder blade to the position it is on her back. Now can you see how little space there is now between your upper arm bone and the shoulder blade? That's where the problem begins, okay? So what I want you guys to do now is you're going to slouch. Go ahead and slouch, just relax your arms. Jess is gonna raise her arms overhead and I want you guys to raise your arms overhead. So everybody raise your arms overhead. As high as you can until you hit that barrier. And all of you should be feeling a little pressure in that front side of your shoulder a little bit or the top of your shoulder. That's your upper arm bone jamming into the roof of the shoulder that I just showed you, compressing the tissues that are in there. We already talked about supraspinatus and the other um, main player in this is the biceps tendon. So those two tendons get compressed when you have that poor positioning of your shoulder blade. So now just lower your arms, stand up nice and tall, get your shoulder blades gently on your back. Everyone's gonna do that. Now raise your arms up overhead as far as you can. Look how much higher, Jess has a little tightness and relax, but look how much higher Jess' arms go and you guys should no longer really feel that compressive feeling. So now with Jess's shoulder blade on her back, rotating up like it's supposed to, you can see that that arm bone, turn to your right, Jess, maintains the spacing and the position on the humerus. That's key, okay? The, what our shoulder blade does on our back affects how the arm bone is seated on that shoulder blade as we hit the volleyball, allowing for that free space for your rotator cuff tissues to pass under the roof of the shoulder blade, okay? Now, I want you guys to, to go ahead and you're gonna do the high elbow action. So go ahead and draw your elbow up nice and high as most um, young players do. Um, unfortunately, this is still being taught. Um, Come closer really to the, come closer to sure. the camera. Okay, so right away, you guys should all feel some compression, that same sort of feeling you had when you were slouching and trying to raise your arm. That same thing is happening with high elbow, okay? Because just the shoulder blade didn't rotate and move like it's supposed to. It's actually lifted and tilted forward, jamming that um, arm bone into the head or the head of the humerus into the loop of the shoulder blade, compressing those tissues. So now what I wanna do is I wanna show you what um, arm action should look like, okay? So can you, can you real quickly touch on something for me? You sure. Reiterate, like if you were trying to do an assessment as a PT for impingement syndrome, what position would you put her arm in to test it? Um, I, yeah, that's a great point. Okay, so this right here, high elbow, right? Relax here. This position right here, let's take one step away. Right here is an impingement test. And then I would pull Jess's hand towards me away from her head, like as if she was hitting a volleyball <laughs> with a high elbow. And I would create impingement in her uh, rotator cuff muscle and her biceps tendon to see if she was, if her tendon was hot or not, inflamed. So that high elbow is a special test for shoulders. You can go out and look at any shoulder literature, um, anything that says Kibler in it, because he is really uh, in the forefront leader of shoulder mechanics and avoiding surgeries. Um, it, he uh, talks about the, the um, impingement test or shoulder tests that we do, and that's a class of one that we do with anyone that comes in. Cool. So before, before we get to good mechanics, let's just talk uh, quickly about um, where most um, volleyball players have shoulder pain. So um, if you have a uh, an athlete that comes to you and says, Jess, why don't you show me where your shoulder was hurting prior to working on arm action? It was right here. Right? So she had pain down the ladder or the outside portion of her arm. Most of the time, people think that's deltoid because the pain is around the deltoid area but it's not a deltoid pain. It's actually referred pain from the supraspinatus, okay? Referred pain is the same thing as when you have a heart attack. You might not have chest pain, but your left arm hurts. That's referred pain, the heart is a muscle. So the supraspinatus muscle 
will cause pain down your arm, sometimes aching into the elbow or into your hand. The other um, class of place that we have pain is in the very front part of that round ball, right? And that is where the biceps tendon sits and it gets compressed under that roof of the scapula, or scapula as well and causes impingement. Okay. okay, so a couple of quick things from my perspective to reiterate. Sure. Number one, the high elbow is putting her elbow in a position that you and the clinic would actually use to confirm that she has impingement syndrome, right? Yes. So that to me, when you said that to me in the past is like, well, that's probably not a great position to be in. Mechanically, yeah. you've shown how it reduces that space. Do me a favor, put the stick to her back and yep. take her into a good position the, and show her how, show everybody how she tilts, how she gets the left shoulder up, right shoulder down. Go ahead and put your stick there. Great, I'm gonna awesome. stand to this side. Yeah, cool. So Jess is a righty. So she's gonna go into that neutral shoulder position for her first arm action. This is what happens right as she lifts her um, arms up as she's getting ready to jump. She would draw that, get her shoulder blade on her back. Right? And then she would go into position two. So go ahead and get into tilt jump. So right there, freeze. So there's the visual you're looking for. And notice what we showed on every other athlete because the shoulder works the same way. It doesn't matter the sport. The shoulder blade is tucked down against what we call the rib cage because it's underneath the shoulder blade. The hand comes up over the shoulder line first, right? Not the elbow. And doing that maintains that space that, that uh, Kelly's been talking about here. Continue, please. Yes. So now I'm going to have Jess hold with her left hand stick a little bit to help me out here. So now I want you to see she has her shoulder blade tucked nicely onto her back. There's still that spacing between the roof of the shoulder blade and the humerus, right? And now as she starts to um, go into the second arm action, so actually rotating and face is backwards, she still maintains that good position or in my world, what we call it seating, right, the PT world. In the uh, volleyball world, Power 360, we talk about the scapula is connected to a leg, the back. And that shoulder blade is Come, come to closer the to the camera, please. Your audio is sure. sure. So now that shoulder blade is going to stay connected to her back as she begins to swing. Now, if you remember, Billy said the um, first thing we're going to go is her hip's going to turn, and then her chest and her elbow will go up high now. And now what I want you to see, I'll spread that up right now. All I'm right. Um, hey, I'm going to freeze you there. Turn Jess yeah. to the back wall. Great. And this is the position that we show the other athletes. The elbow is going to maybe come up above the line, but tilt her really into that contact position. So really tilt her to the left. Cool. And put your stick back on there and take your hand up to contact, please. Kelly, put the stick on her yeah, back yeah, and then that. just go right up to contact with your hand. <laughs> cool. So what I want you to notice is the real key in all this, and it's hard to see, but that right scap, when it's trained appropriately, is tucked back against the rib cage and it actually connects the rib cage and the arm motion to the turn of the core. When we do this in baseball, when we do it with overhead with overhead motions in baseball, from a performance perspective, we see a two to four mile per hour increase immediately in ball speed when they stay connected. Mm -hmm. The athletes also then feel that they feel much more athletic. They don't have the shoulder pain. They don't have the back pain. So visually, the elbow may come up above that line, but the shoulder is actually tilted. In volleyball mechanics, and you can, you can lose the, the uh, shoulder model, we want the right arm, and some of you guys are teaching this, it's good, the right arm should be over the left leg at contact. Jess, if you can show that position from the back view. So at contact, her body would be tilted to the left. Yep. Yes, and it allows the spine to tilt. It keeps the upper arm in a relatively good position and that shoulder blade is still connected up until contact to the rib cage. That allows us to use the hips, the core and connect and create so much more force. And as you're gonna hear in just a few minutes, 
that takes the pressure off the shoulder. We don't get into that impingement syndrome, right? The athlete will feel it, they'll hit harder, it protects their shoulder in the process. And I'll suggest to you all the other athletes we've already looked at, that's what they've learned to do. That's what we're teaching to do. And that's the information we want you guys as coaches, trainers, athletes to teach your athletes to do. But Kelly, we're gonna, to, we're, go ahead. Sure, I just wanna say one key thing is that everything that you just said about contact and using the hips, the key thing about the anatomy is, is when she's in that position, go ahead, is that the relationship of the upper arm bone into the shoulder blade is exactly the same as it was when her arm was down her side, at her side. It only changes after she makes contact and her arm swings through to her left pocket, that's when the shoulder blade moves off of the back a little bit. And that should not happen until after contact point. Okay. okay. Do me a favor, stay right there. And let's talk about that because we've said that the right hand goes to the left pocket on a power swing. We're not saying like on a cut shot or a roll shot. Keep her right where she was. Go right back okay. where she was. <laughs> Take your arm forward, right hand to the left pocket and explain with your left hand the muscles that are connected to the scap, into the spine, the lats, the left hip. Talk to us about why that protects the shoulder. Okay, so you have your middle trap, lower trap, uh, muscle called the serratus anterior, which is underneath here, the latissimus muscles that attach, they attach to the back. As she swings through the ball, all of these muscles serve to decelerate her arm. It's accelerating as she's going through the ball, but and then something has opposed. Yeah. yeah, it's slowing it down. Instead of, excuse me a sec, Jess, instead of this action that I see so many people teach, you have nothing really slowing that down. And the damage that you are doing to the biceps tendon is profound. And so when do that motion yourself, you just did with your right hand staying on your right side of your body. Go ahead and do that, Kelly, yourself. Take your right hand down to your side and guess what position you just put your shoulder and scap into. That's the impingement position, right? Okay, cool, awesome. All right, we're gonna scoop forward, great job. Hang on, I'm gonna share screen with everybody again. Hang on just a second. All right, can everybody see my screen? Nicole, are we good? Thumbs up, awesome. All right, um, I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly to stay on time, but what I'm gonna suggest to everybody is if we get into how do you increase arm and ball speed safely, we've talked a lot about the position of the shoulder, keeping the elbow below the shoulder line until you get to contact. And the position of that shoulder blade on the rib cage is what's known in the baseball world as scap load. In volleyball, we talk about connecting the scap to the rib cage. But if we go broader here, what do we really need to do to generate and tolerate more arm speed? If we, number one, just don't want to use the arm and shoulder. If you look at a, 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 an old balsa airplane and you turn the propeller, right? What ends up happening in that rubber band is you create elastic energy, right? And when you let the propeller go, the tension, the energy in that band unwinds the propeller, right? Well, in the body, it's the same kind of thing. If we get athletes to understand and coaches and trainers to understand that the body, the muscles themselves and other tissue in the body called fascia is all very elastic. And when we load, we use the arm and shoulder correctly. We turn the shoulder to the right for right-handed hitter to the right, and then the hips turn to the left, right? And that body turn, what happens is, is we wind up to the, we go to the right, we're winding up and we then turn to our hips to our left. It's creating this big stretch through the muscles and the fascia. It loads up that elastic tissue and then we hit harder. And with athletes I've talked to, they talk about pro athletes saying that it's like effortless power. The effortless power isn't because I'm trying to muscle the whole swing. I'm loading and I'm stretching into the elastic tissues of the body. And so um, when we do that, it's not just a shoulder swing. We want to use the legs, the hips, the core, the buttocks, the arms, the chest, the rotator cuff, all that together. 
The difference is when we teach a clinic, we take a super beetle on the left and say, if you took a stock super beetle, it has 25, 25 horsepower to it. It's a small motor. That's kind of what the arm and shoulder does. Even with a turbo on the arm and shoulder, if you make your arm and shoulder and rotator cuff strong, so maybe you got a turbo. Now maybe you've got 75 horsepower out of your shoulder. But if you look at a Corvette, a Corvette has a motor in it stock right now that's almost 500 horsepower. It's a huge motor, right? The Corvette is your hips, your legs, your core, your abs, your buttocks, your chest, your shoulder, your arm, it's everything together. If you can learn to load into the elastic tissues of the body by rotating, coiling up, moving your right arm and shoulder correctly, and then turning your hips to the left, you're going to load into the Corvette. You're going to hit the, the ball so much harder. And most importantly for the athlete, their shoulder and back is going to feel so much better because they're not putting their shoulder in a bad position that might create impingement, pain, damage, or something else. So the big key is then we're trying to teach athletes how to load into these elastic tissues. How you do that is very specific. A couple of other things we've talked about. This is an athlete. If you watch the video we sent out ahead, this is a 17-year-old a year ago. Got shut down, played on one of the top teams in Colorado, right? Won an open tournament last year. She got shut down in January because of high elbow position. Her shoulder was so inflamed that the doc shut her down. They came to me. We worked for a couple months. And what did we work on? Taking her right shoulder blade and connecting it to her rib cage, strengthening the muscles, but strengthening the muscles with her elbow below the, the shoulder line as she pulls it back and then turning her hips, turning her chest, turning her shoulder with that scap connected. That's how we create that power. That's how we tolerate that torque on the shoulder. Once again, we're reinforcing the right elbow needs to stay at or below the shoulder line. This is one of the clinics we did last summer. We have one here this weekend. Same thing. You can see these athletes. We're teaching them how to tilt their shoulder, left hand up for right-handed hitter, draw the elbow down, connect it to the rib cage, and then they're going to rotate. This, the strength and conditioning, and I'm a strength and conditioning coach, uh, Nicole, or excuse me, not Nicole, Kelly is as well, but what we teach is not just the basics for lifts. It's not just squats and RDLs and lunges, right? Those are general exercises that will make you generally stronger. All you guys are working with rotational athletes. These patterns, these movements that we're teaching are highly specialized, highly specific. So what we do and what we want you guys to learn to do is we use harnesses on the hips, we use bands, we teach the hips as a primary first power source, right, to create the rotation of the body with the arm in a good position, how to turn the hips. Because when the hips turn through the abdominal muscles, big strong muscles, that's going to turn the rib cage. The turn of the rib cage, especially with the arm in a good position, is going to create that arm width. We're going to strengthen and condition the, the, the muscles that create the, the movements of the body that we want the athlete to learn to do. Highly specific, highly specialized. And once again, once we wind up, we're basically going to turn our shoulders to the right and we're going to unwind and release that power by turning the hips and belly button to the left. In summary, before we get into Q&A, poor mechanics for a lot of athletes equals pain and sometimes injuries. And so what we're hoping to have done today is provide some kind of anatomical and physiological basis for what's going on why the high elbow isn't a great idea to teach for all the obvious reasons. And I'm going to give you some new terminology. People talk about sometimes when they swing the way where other athletes are, are throwing or hitting overhead, they call it a low elbow, but they say it in a way that it sounds like a derogative comment. What we're talking about, the position Kelly showed earlier is a neutral shoulder. That's the shoulder sitting in a position that it best generates and tolerates the, the torque going on at the shoulder to allow the athlete to hit harder. We're wanting you guys to start, and we hope we could have done that today a little bit, to start to learn some understanding, have an understanding of the anatomy and the physiology of the shoulder. One thing we didn't show, but I'm going to say it to you now, and maybe we can get into it in a second here in the Q&A. When you keep your shoulder down in that neutral shoulder position with that elbow below the shoulder line, when that arm comes up and the body starts to turn, you stretch and you load a muscle we haven't talked about today called your pectoralis major. If you're a right-handed hitter and if you're looking at me, it's on the right side of the chest. It's one of the biggest, strongest muscles that will allow, uh, actually allow an overhand throwing or hitting athlete to hit or throw harder. When you do a high elbow and you take the arm up, performance-wise, you're loading into the rotator cuff, maybe a little anterior delt, 
and then tricep, it's predominantly, it is an arm and shoulder swing. When you load into the body, like every other athlete is doing in the world, and you get your scap in a good position to where you don't get that impingement, when the arm comes up and the body starts to turn, you actually stretch and load that pec muscle as well. It's additional power. The athletes will feel it immediately. We see the radar gun come up in our clinics six, seven, eight miles an hour, typically in about a 20 minute period, just by teaching them these mechanics. From your perspective in terms of legal risk, I'm not an attorney, but I will suggest this to you. Um, people like Kelly, people in the medical world, the docs, the PTs, the chiropractors, they all understand the shoulder and the anatomy very well. But for some reason, that information's not getting shared with a lot of coaches out there. And so what I'm going to suggest to you is that if, if, if you're teaching it, in some cases, what's going on out there is you guys are forcing and telling athletes they have to use the high elbow position or they can't play for you you're probably exposing yourself to legal risk because the anatomy and physiology of the shoulder is pretty clear. If you had Kelly or somebody like that put on the stand and you're telling athletes they have to swing in a specific way, then you might be putting, exposing yourself to risk you don't want. You're certainly not doing, a, you certainly are doing a disservice to the athlete. We would love to be a guide for you, right? We would love to help guide you guys, be a resource for you to help teach you more of the specifics of how do you how do you, how do you teach the body to do this? How do you do it fast? Um, and, and, and I'm going to play before we quit. Before we go to Q and A, I'm going to play. This is a video. This was recorded yesterday. This is a 16 year old. It's in our master class right now. Her father's a physical therapist. I'm going to play this for you because this is all real. This is not staged. I'm going to play this. I hope the audio is good for you. Hello, my name is Aubrey Packer. I am a, going to be a junior and I am a pin hitter. I used to have shoulder pain in the beginning of this program. And it was in front of my shoulder and I had some lower back pain. I started using the program and my shoulder pain has completely gone away. Every time I swing, it's not painful at all and there's no more back pain. So um, I'm Aubrey's dad. My name is John Packer. I'm a physical therapist. And when I saw uh, Billy's program online, uh, from a, you know, a kinematics point of view and, and the fundamentals of movement, I really liked what he was teaching. I didn't have the knowledge of uh, how to incorporate a volleyball swing uh, with safe shoulder movements. And when I saw what he was doing, I said, this is it. This is what we do. And so we uh, got Aubrey signed up for the course and she's a quick learner and uh, credit to her, she's been dedicated and really putting the time to do it. And her shoulder pain, it was, you know, almost overnight where she started swinging better, her shoulder felt better. Um, velocity improved, she was in the thirties. And last time we measured her, she was almost in the thirties uh, miles per hour in swing. And uh, she's enjoying it. We're after through the course now just about and uh, really excited for uh, the good things to come. And I'm grateful for this class. I think it's a good thing. And I think it's something any girl that wants to hit hard and do so safely uh, should be able to go to this course. Awesome. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Kelly, if you'll come back on, we're going to go to Q&A session here. And Nicole, if you would, we're going to try to share here and see what the questions are. We're going to look in the chat function and um, see if we can answer some of these questions. So, hey, Nicole, if you would maybe just verbally um, ask a question from anybody that's asking, if you'll say it so everybody can hear it and then we'll address it. Yeah, well, hi, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Um, I'm just reading through the comments here right now. Um, I think something also that we can talk about or Billy, you can touch upon is um, I think at the beginning when I was learning this as a high schooler, I think it was hard for me at the beginning to understand how starting with a low elbow or a low load turns into a higher contact point because, um, you know, again, like what we talked about with a neutral shoulder or like a lower elbow how does that correlate into having actually a higher contact point? Gotcha. Kelly, you want to start with that? Um, sure. So basically what happens is 
that as you um, draw your arm back and connect that shoulder blade and you have your arm in that same position, as you start to rotate, as Bill was talking about, generally can you come come closer to the camera. So as you start to turn and rotate and develop power, right? The only way that you lose that part is your shoulder to be connected. But as I start to go from my right tilt to my left tilt, and it automatically allows my elbow to come high right before contact, and that that motion. Is what allows that elbow to go high. We don't, like we said, we don't want to play a little early. It's kind of like baseball where there's a fade, the base of the throwing. There's space in the volleyball hitting. And as you start to turn through, um, as your arms, your uh, chest starts to come through, it will automatically bring your elbow high so that when you contact, you're able to contact at the very end of the length of your arm versus here. I'm going to try to reiterate that because Kelly, your audio is not good. I'm going to, I'm going to, it's all right. You do the motion as I talk them through it. So turn your back sure. to me, please. And yeah. so go through a, a, a load phase, right? So there's our setup. We go up in the air and basically now, right now we could imagine that sticks there. What's going to happen is she's going to take a step, right? And the, in, in the volleyball, the step is the attack, the approach. The hip's going to start to turn. The turn of the hips is going to start to turn the chest through. Now, what ends up happening is, go back to the start, Kelly, for just a second. When she's up in the air, notice the left shoulder is higher than the right. That's common. That's what it should be doing. But when we get to contact, because of the turn of the body, go ahead and get up to contact, Kelly. And if you'll face that black door behind you, please, so we see your back. Uh, no, turn, turn your back all the way to me. Very good. Cool. Right there. Cool. Notice now that she's got her arm up. If we've done a really good job of connecting her shoulder blade, her scap to her rib cage, the arm and elbow have went above, but because we've rotated, the right arm gets above the left leg, the axis of the body, the spine, if you would, has tilted, right? That's what we have to teach the athletes. Some will get it on their own. I made a mistake years ago and I learned working with a D1 outside hitter in the summer because go ahead and get your shoulders parallel, Kelly. The coach called me the first week and said, boy, she's hitting the ball hard and every ball is going out of bounds, left side, right? So go ahead and turn for me. If the shoulders stay parallel and so at contact, if the right arm is over the right leg, as it is right now, more than likely she's going to hit that ball and that ball is going to get pulled outside out of bounds, right? The reality is getting to a good position now, if at contact, the right arm ought to be over the left leg. That way they can turn their body crazy, create all kinds of rotational torque, get the arm and hand on top of the ball, hit a line shot, right, to a deep one, right? That's what we're looking for. But it starts with the step, with the hip turn, the chest turn, and the arm being in a good position. The arm's still in a good position relative to the shoulders here. And especially if we've taught the athlete to connect their scap and stay connected until contact point. After the contact point, her hand's gonna go down to her left hip. And at that point, the scap moves normally. It is normal for it to move at that point in time. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that uh, handles that because I think that happens a lot at the beginning or that's a very common question. Uh, there's a couple questions coming through about how this relates to serving. Uh, one is, is there a difference in the shoulder movement when doing a full swing and a float serve? Yeah, so short answer is these are power swings we're talking about. If you're hitting a jump, jump serve, a power serve or a spin or something like that, we're trying to create power. So this is that the mechanics we're teaching you today. It's not a floater, right? If you're hitting a floater, we're not, we're not doing the same thing. We don't have to be as concerned with that because you're not putting as much force and torque on the shoulder, the back and the body. But when you're trying to hit a jump serve and you're trying to bring it and hit a spinner and have it drop, we want power, we want spin. So this is gonna be the same thing. When we're training the athletes, when we start with, we want them to be able to do these motions on the ground, then we go into the air. And then in a few sessions, a few hours, a few weeks, whatever the case is, then we're gonna start converting that into a jump serve for the older athletes. Go ahead, Kelly. Well, I would like to say with the younger athletes, I, I do a lot of training. Um, Come closer, please. Sure. I do a lot of training with eight-year-olds on up. 
and I start all of my eight-year-olds on the um, program of connecting that scapula, getting that solid core, so that as they learn to step and turn into the ball, they can maximize the power of their body versus most little kids just wail at the ball with their arm. I believe that that sets them up for when they're learning to hit down balls, when they're starting to learn to do an approach and jump and hit the ball, they already have really good mechanics. And so then you're fighting those original mechanics for serving do transfer over. So I would argue that learning to load the scapula, learning to keep that scapula attached as you turn and come through to contact the ball on serving. A, makes them much more better servers, much better servers. B, starts the foundation for them to learn to hit the ball like we want to once they start to become airbound. I, I think it's critical. Okay. Um, a couple other questions I, I'm looking here that people are asking. Um, one, if my daughter already has some shoulder pain, is it too late to get started? No. Um, Aubrey, the girl you heard and John's daughter just a few minutes ago, she literally had shoulder pain still two weeks ago. They started four weeks ago in our master class. Um, it takes time, but, but in essence, no, it's not too late. Um, it's, it, 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 the, the mechanics can make, and in some cases, in their case, we did last week on Monday, I did a live session for the athletes and the parents and coaches that are involved with that. And we taught them how to connect their scabs via Zoom to their shoulder blades, right? That's what made the difference in her swing in her back. She's hitting the ball harder, but she's now doing it and her shoulder pain and back pains went away. It's so critical and I know it's technical, um, but it's so huge in terms of your ability to do that. So it's not too late. Don't let it go on because it might just be inflammation right now, but if it goes beyond inflammation, there's a lot of other things that could happen to make permanent damage. So let's you know try to jump in and try to, to alter their swings, improve their mechanics now. Um, I saw a question that asked about what exercises do I do to teach scab load. I originally um, did some things a little differently, but after I met Billy and understood his methodology and the science behind, especially the exercise science behind it, I then put that together with what I was doing from a physical therapy standpoint. And I used the methodology that he uses for power hitting with the little kids the same way, teaching them how to scab load teaching them how to throw the ball appropriately. Um, so many kids don't even know how to throw today, but if you teach them throwing mechanics, then they will learn how to serve the ball with good mechanics. And I would suggest that you can, we can use the um, master trainer programming to teach young kids. You just modify the fact that they're not jumping and they're not doing a big approach and those sorts of things aren't happening yet but you can use everything in that system to start your athletes up with a great foundation. I gotcha. even use the hip turn as so, well. So to reiterate something she just said, one of the things that we do that's actually very good, it's very different, um, and, and everybody knows this, <laughs> there is, um, the US is very segmented, right? You go see your PT, you go see your hitting coach, you go see your strength coach, you go see all these different people. When you go on the court, everything has to be there now from hitting to performance to injury prevention. The reality is the, what we do is we train mechanics, right? So we teach them the mechanics. We put bands on the hips, bands on the arms, band on the shoulders. So as they're learning and building the muscle memory for the mechanics, we're strengthening the muscles that make those movements happen at the same time. So it's much different from going and working on mechanics training today. And then tomorrow I'm going to go do my strength training and they're totally disconnected, right? We look at the movements of the sport, we train the movements of the sport in the right mechanics, we do it against resistance and the muscles, it's just so much more efficient. So um, next question here, uh, surface, somebody was asking, does the surface yeah. make a difference for the shoulder movement? No, the shoulder's the shoulder, the movement's the same, whether you're playing indoor, playing beach, the movements, the mechanics are the same, right? Um, if you're trying to generate and tolerate power, we're suggesting you do the same thing. Um, Billy, I had a question come through. Yes. Uh, I think it was a direct. Should the humerus be internally rotated when the upper body torques back? No. The no, best athletes rotated. in the world, as and this is really advanced. So, you know, I work with some guys that play Major League Baseball, 
And what we trained with them and realized for some of them, we've been training two or three years. So this is like the PhD advanced level. But ultimately, if I've been working with an athlete for a while, it's called in throwing. If you go Google this, and I learned this in physical education 40 years ago, it's called the late cocking phase, right? The hips for a right-handed hitter thrower, the hips should be turning left and the arm is still going up and going into external rotation at the same time. So if I try to give you a little bit of a visual, my hips are turning left and my arm and shoulder are going up into external rotation. When I do that, it creates a stretch from my pec, my anterior deltoid, the internal rotators in the shoulder, uh, the pec major, all the muscles and fascia across the front of my thigh down to my left hip. And so that's the trigger when that hip starts to go to the left and the arm goes to the right, it's all automatic. If the athlete's loaded and done this correctly, it's coming. It's what we call in the conditioning world, a stretch shortening cycle. And you'll get immediate improvement in arm velocity and arm force. And it's not at the conscious level. It happens. In Kelly's world, it's called a myotatic reflex. We train athletes, right? That's what we're training them to do. It's not something you take a 13 year old and teach them the first week. And, and we get that because we're always in different athletes we're working with talking about hip and shoulder separation. That's what it is. And we get contacted now from baseball dads, volleyball moms, coaches, and saying, I've got a nine or a 10 year old, I wanna work, work on separation. That's not what you work on at nine, 10 or 12 or 13. There's a lot more that has to be done first and foremost, and, and it happens, but it happens later down the road, but it is important. We're, and Billy, that internal rotation thing, remember, internal rotation is an impingement test. So really, even as we come through and we contact the ball, we're not internally rotating our shoulder. That internal rotation, there's some that happens automatically as you come up, but we're not forcing any internal rotation because that's an impingement um, waiting to happen. That's what we use. We use internal rotation for impingement testing. Um, and Kelly, let's see if we can walk them through a visual of that. So go through and go just right, right where you're standing. Go ahead and go into your load phase. So you're taking your scap and shoulder turn to the right. And now go ahead and go into external rotation with your right hand up. And as she's doing that, what I was just saying a minute ago, her hips would be turning to the left at the same time. If her, stat, if her right shoulder blade stays connected to her rib cage, as her hips and chest start to turn and the elbow starts to come up now to the ball, Elbow comes up, elbow comes up, comes up, scoot back to the left so we can see you're going out of frame. Then we're still connected to the, so the turn of the chest, turn of the shoulders, we're not putting that big internal um, rotation force on the shoulder because we're still connected to the rib cage and back. And now if her chest keeps turning to the left, to the doors to her left, and then the arm follows through to the left pocket, that's how we generate using all the big muscles, all the connective elastic tissues of the body. That's how we generate and tolerate that and take the stress and pressure off the shoulder. And that's what we're trying to do, spread it out, get that isolated shoulder torque and force off just the shoulder. The shoulder's still working, but it's working with all the other big muscles of the body that can create that rotational power. Nicole, what else you got? Anything else? Yeah, uh, next question, would one use the front arm to pull down and generate power and change the shoulder angle? I'm assuming front arm uh, refers to non-hitting arm. Yeah, so here's, here's the key and here's the analogy we teach. It should hand, your left hand should come as a right-handed hitter to the center of your chest, right? And it comes down quick and early. And what happens is they do that. It's just like a figure skater you see in the Olympics. When a figure skater goes into a tight, fast spin, their hands, arms, and legs all come in straight to the center of their body. That increases rotational torque, right? When we're doing assessments, right? So we're working right now with a lot of 13 and 14 year olds. And, and what'll happen is Kelly, if you'll show this, when they start to work on the right arm action, we work on that first, their left hand and arm will stay out in front of the body. And that's gonna slow down Kelly's shoulder turn. That's gonna slow down rotation. Some of you guys I know right now we're working with your daughters within a week or so, we'll start telling them to bring their left hand down to their heart soon and fast. So go ahead and do that, Kelly. That helps now create more rotational turn of the body. That's gonna increase more arm speed, more arm whip, and ultimately more ball velocity. So it's not the first thing we do. We're concerned with other factors first, but we will get to that point where we just say, bring your left hand to the center of your chest, bring it early, bring it quick. And you'll see it. You'll see the athlete turn faster, turn further. You'll hear it in the ball with a ball coming off the hand. It's just creating more body torque. 
There's a question about the left arm coming across to the, or the right arm finishing to the left pocket on a line shot. No, if you're hitting power down the line, that's a hip rotation thing. The faster you turn your hips, the harder you're gonna pull that ball down the line. Um, so it's not going to, um, you would not, so I think a lot of people think that when you hit line, you should be doing this. That is incorrect, okay? Use, if I'm coming in as a right side of the camera one on the outside, if I'm coming in and I'm up into the air, it's a contact point, right? I'm hitting the ball here and finishing and turning my hips through as fast as I can to pull that ball down the line. It's not changing where your arm finishes. Yes, there are shots in volleyball. Obviously, there's cut shots across court to like the four. That's not a power shot. If I'm jumping in the air and I'm cutting that ball to the four on the outside, I'm not swinging as hard as I possibly can. The mechanics still are the same all the way to contact, and then I just cut my hand down, thumb down to push the ball to the right side of the court or their left side. But I'm not changing my mechanics, and that is not a power shot. So those are two different things. Gotcha. Nicole, anything else we're missing here? There's a lot of questions starting to come Yeah, up. there's a couple of comments just about resources, about scap loading. Um, oh gosh, we got more coming in. <laughs> um, also, let's see, there's one, I, I think I can answer this, you guys can jump in. There's one kind of uh, more specific to volleyball, just talking about if you have your left front player, which is facing the center, facing the court as a right-handed hitter, you also have your middle hitter and then your, your right side hitter. Um, and so basically the question is, how does that change or does your footwork change or how you're opening up, um, depending on where you are on the court and where your setter is, um, long story short is that your approach and basically shouldn't change to, if you are a right handed hitter on the right side of the ball has to cross your body, you still have to open up to generate power because if you're just facing your setter or just facing the net is which we see a lot of that in the clinics then that's when we have that shoulder pain. That's when we can't generate the power and speed that we need. Um, so anyways, maybe depending on the preference of the hitter, their um, line of approach can change. So it can be more outside the court or more inside, that's fine. But they still need to be opening their body and rotating uh, to create that uh, power and speed. So I hope that answers that question. Um, yes, next so question. Simply their belly button as they come in, whether you're on the outside, middle, or right side, that belly button should be pointed to the right end tunnel on your last two steps. Yeah, great. Um, we touched upon this one question is what happens with the hand as you generate more power in a volleyball swing, the ball seems to fly higher and out of bounds on the back line. That's probably a contact point. Yeah. Right? Their elbow is probably actually dropping a little bit at contact, right? And so, and they're hitting under the ball a little bit, and that's what drives that ball out of bounds. Uh, next one is, are there any stretches that players can do in non-practice time in the morning or throughout the day? Well, the Power 360 system and the training methodology can all be done on the court. Most of the work is done in standing with the system. So you can train your arm paddling, scapular load, hip turn, contact point. You don't need a net. You don't need a ball necessarily um, in the beginning. Um, we have a lot of people that are training. If you train at home, the, the, the piece about training is in order to develop a pattern of movement that when you go out onto the floor, that's what your body does. You have to repeat that over and over and over and over, not in a game, not on a court. So that's how, that's how we train our athletes is they're doing it in the same way you would go work out in a gym. You are putting that time in off the court, training the right pattern of movement. Great. And then this one kind of um, is attached to that a little bit. So for hitting mechanics training of young athletes, uh, should they be hitting the ball under the net or over the net? Um, most of the time that we train, we have them hit into the net out in front of them so they can keep that higher contact point. 
if you have one hidden under the mat, most kids, um, even in the high school, unless they're really tall and have great hops, they're not contacting on top of the ball like that. So if you're having them put the ball out here and the ball goes down and under the mat, they're actually not contacting at their highest point, right? So we work on as they contact, they contact high, turn their hips, and then the ball will go into the net so that they could use a rebounder or you could use a net for that. Um, yeah, most of the time it's in standing into the net. Great. And then next question, um, what do you use more to aim in a volleyball swing? Your feet, hip, shoulder. As you swing harder, does the player need to aim more left because you said the miss will be to the right? Here's, I'll jump on that. Here's yeah. the hand directs the ball, the hand's the steering wheel. So we want athletes to turn their body with big time torque, right? And we don't really want that to change where they're hitting line, hitting a cut shot to a four or five. It doesn't matter. We don't want to give away a cue when their body, if their body slows down. So we want them to rotate fast and hard. The driving force, the directional, the thing that provides direction to the ball is the hand, right? The hand should go through the ball and take the ball, whether you're, you're going one, then let it, let the hand go to the one, and then it's going to follow through to your left hip pocket after that, right? If I'm hitting a cut shot with less power, I'm going five or four. The body's rotating, but the hand is going to hit the ball, drive the ball to where you want it to go, and then it's going to follow through, if that makes sense. So you don't have to, that's, that's too much to think about that, like, yes. how do I change my rotation? It's like, no, just take your hand through the ball and make your hand go where you want the ball to go. The other piece to that, Billy, is they need to train the arm action. And then what they'll learn to do is the more reps they get in hitting and in the air, it's actually like when the ball gets to you. So if I want to hit the five, I contact the ball long before it crosses my right shoulder. If I want to hit line, I let the ball go a little bit further, still do the same mechanics, but I pull it down the line. But that's really advanced. The key thing is, is to train the arm action so that you can then learn how to do those things with the ball. Yeah. Anything else, Nicole? Yeah, just some comments coming through. Uh, there's one that says, I still see so many coaches having young kids trained by hitting under the net for the bounce with poor mechanics. Um, so I think that kind of touches upon what we've been, well, you guys more than me, but what do you guys have been talking about? And I think a big thing with that um, and just teaching kids from, as young as they can to be hitting over a net is even at the highest levels, Olympians, gold medalists, um, especially our national team and stuff, you're not gonna see in their games at an international level, they're not gonna be hitting that many balls, whether they're outsides, middles or opposites. They're not gonna be hitting that many on the 10 foot line. A lot of the points that they're scoring is in the back three feet of the court or like hitting uh, the block out of bounds. And so, in warm-ups, it might look really cool <laughs> if you have some, some hitters that can hit that and they're physical enough to do that. But when you're in a game, it's completely different. You're not going to be because you have a block in front of you. So um, I think from the beginning or as from a young of an age as possible, it's super important just to have uh, your athletes keep that in mind. Yeah, and from a muscle memory perspective, Kelly kind of touched on this, but if you're teaching a kid to hit under the net, you're developing the wrong muscle memory and that muscle memory doesn't go away. So if they did that for a year or two years with your nine or 10 or whatever, and they're hitting under the net, you're going to have to try to change that now when they're 12, 13 or 14. And it, it's not a matter. Sometimes parents come to our clinic and it's like, oh, I, my daughter just needs to know how to do this in her head. It's not a matter of cognitive knowledge, right? It's not a matter of knowing how to do it. You've got to go build a muscle memory through thousands of reps doing it whatever way you want to do it. So if an athlete's been nine or 10 and they're hitting underneath the net, the brain, the nervous system has built that muscle memory. Those are the instructions and that's what that athlete's going to learn to do. Now they come a couple of years later and you're wondering why they're always hitting the ball into the ribbon or into the net. Well, that's what they've been training to do for the last two or three years. So to both of their points, Kelly and Nicole, yeah, we, we've got to hit the ball up, hit the top, learn how to hit a spinner, learn how to hit it with power. So that ball is either hitting somebody's high hard in the hands and deflecting on the other side of the net or dropping in the court, all good. But you, you, you got to be careful because you're developing muscle memory, the wrong muscle memory. Definitely. We got one more question. Is this program online, online, or what city are you in? 
So the, the master class will touch on this and we'll probably send a follow-up email to give you guys some information on it. Uh, it's a combination. So it's an eight week program that's written. We have a, we, we, you know, we use a training platform where we have weekly exercises for week one that's different from week two, but basically that's online. And then it's a combination of once a week, I go through, I do a swing analysis of every athlete. I give them one thing to work on that week based on where they're at. They might be in week one, week three, week six. It's once again, different. It might be in an arm swing. They might be working on approach. They might be working on hip turn, but I do a swing analysis each week. I tell the athlete what I want them to work on specifically one thing. And then that, that, that's being uploaded live, right? So we're looking at that. And then three days a week, the athlete actually has to submit. They have a program they have to follow. They have to submit videos three times a week of their exercises they're doing in the hip harness, the torso harness, the arm cuffs. And once again, we're following up on that and we're quality controlling saying, change this, do that, do this with your elbow, do this with your, you know, your scap. We're quality controlling that. And then Kelly jumps in if a kid's having pain and part of what her responsibility is, is she looks, we track the athlete's data. So if they're having shoulder pain, hip pain, knee pain, whatever, we're jumping in and engaging. And, and so then twice a week, on uh, I jump on and do live FaceTime or live Zoom sessions. Um, and I'm dealing with the athletes, the parents, the coaches. And so we're answering questions like just like this, but then actually talking specifically to the answering those questions for the athlete. And then finally, um, we have a private Facebook group and that's where we post the videos. We post analyses. We, we can communicate back and forth with the coaches, the parents, the athletes to make them better, right? So they can actually see what we're talking about and, and stay with them. So, so I guess long story made short, that's a long-winded way of saying it's a combination between online but there's a lot of live stuff that happens that way you're getting us, you're getting our expertise and not just on mechanics or strength and conditioning. Nicole's a part of that. And so we'll talk about the mental side as well and other things. And, and even one of the things, Sammy put a question up here about, um, you know, cold stretching versus active warm ups. And so that's something that's huge. And, and those are the kind of things we address with the coaches, with the athletes, with the parents, because to that point, I'm gonna go ahead and answer it. Um, we talked about this. We did a, a, a Zoom session last night with the parents and coaches, and that question came up. Somebody said they were doing stretches before their, their workout. It's like stretches is old school, right? I mean, 30 years ago, we stopped teaching that as a strength coach. We don't stretch ahead of time. We warm up, we activate, we turn muscles in the nervous system on. Because when you do the traditional old passive stretch, it's actually shutting things down. And that's the last thing you want to do is have an athlete go into practice, go into a game, go into a match. With things shut down yeah they're loose but if you know who gumby was those of you that are old like me you know who gumby is you're like gumby you've got no control of anything and now your risk for an injury for your shoulder back near something else you don't want muscles and the nervous system shut down you want them activated and turned on so they can create power create stability protect the body as they're creating all these rotational forces and everything else so anyway any other questions Somebody's asking, where do we go for pricing and more information? Um, let me give you some contact information for us. Um, for PowerCore 360, for me personally, go to Billy. And maybe, Nicole, you can oh, type Nicole, this in. Can just, I, yeah. I think it's on the last slide, too, but I'll write it in anyways here. Okay, cool. Um, go to Billy at PowerCore360.com, B-I-L-L-Y at PowerCore360.com. Kelly is at Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y at PowerCore360.com. Nicole is Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E at PowerCore360.com. Phone number for me is 970-556-0435. And so you can text me, you can call me, you can email me. Um, email us at any of those. We will send you information if you're interested in the master class. And we can send you links. You can get more information on that. Um, any other questions? If not, I think we'll close. I'll give one more chance for final questions. Yeah, I just put your number in there and I'll put mine. <laughs> I don't Thank know you. if you got it right. I'll put mine in as well. Okay. We do run clinics, just FYI. We have a clinic this weekend in Colorado. We have another one in July on the weekend, July 11th and 12th. Um, 
some shameless plugging. If you join in the master class, you can come to the eight hour clinics for free. We won't pay your registration is free. We don't pay your travel, but you can come and, and that's that's part of it. So I, I will just say to you, we're always constantly trying to improve the process of making athletes better. Um, the master class for us, we started it, I think, four or five weeks ago. It's the best thing we've done because it, uh, we've actually tried to go out and train other coaches to certify them to teach our stuff. Um, it's just a lot. Now we're doing it actually ourselves. And even though not everybody loves doing virtual training, it's actually a good combination of doing virtual training, seeing the videos, giving quality control to give back to the athletes, the parents, the coaches. So anyway. Um, I do see one final question. And so someone asked, can you talk about what you're teaching versus what my club does and fear about playing time? Yeah, that, that is such, that, that's a real issue. So I'll say it in a different way. I guarantee you this weekend, as we start teaching athletes, all this stuff we're teaching them there, the athletes are going to feel it. The ball velocities are going to come up. They're going to start feeling it. They're going to look better. It sounds better. The out, some parents are going to say to us, because we do breakout sessions, we bring the parents in and the parents will say to us, okay, but our coach at club is teaching the high elbow. And what do we tell the, you know, what do we, what do we do in that environment? And the short story is this, that's where I think there's personally, I think there's legal exposure if you don't take the time to educate yourself about the shoulder, the anatomy, the physiology, and you're still teaching that, and now you're forcing an athlete, because I know it happens, where I've heard it from, you know, the, the, the coach will say, you have to swing this way in this club. Well, in my opinion, boy, you're exposing yourself to some liability, because if that kid gets hurt, personally, I think you, you own that injury. But what we end up will tell, tell the parents and tell the kids is, um, I don't think, and this is my opinion, Kelly and Nicole, you guys can speak to this in a second. We want the kid to learn the right mechanics. I look well beyond what they're playing at 13, 14, 16, or 18. You know, I mean, I know Terry Pettit. I know John Cook. I know a lot of those coaches. Um, you know, I knew John Denning when he's at Stanford. So I, I have a pretty good feeling for what they're looking for. And they're not looking for tore up shoulders. They're not looking for injuries. And that's what they're getting. So, you know, we're trying to teach the parents and the athletes to say, you need to make a change. And in my opinion, if you need to change clubs, then change clubs. Because in essence, if it was my son or daughter, um, I'm going to pull them, right? I'm going to take them somewhere. I'm not going to destroy my kid's shoulder, their back or their knee for somebody's ego that won't take the time to actually get educated and informed about how the body, how the shoulder, how the back, how it all works. So it's tough. I realize that we will deal with it this weekend. Um, but usually we just say to the kid, I think most coaches, if you start pounding the ball and score, most coaches are probably going to leave you alone because most of them probably don't care. And I'm probably speaking for the choir here, but maybe I shouldn't be. My guess is if your kid's hitting the ball hard or your athletes hitting the ball hard and scoring, um, a lot of coaches don't care how they're doing it. We do because once again, we care about their health and their welfare long term. Kelly, Nicole, I'm sure you guys have feelings here. I was just going to say, I agree with everything you said. The only thing that I would add is to remember that, and I'm in the club world and I know it can be very, um, you can be fearful of switching clubs because you're on such a great team, even though this coach really isn't training my child right or whatever. The bottom line that you have to remember is colleges are not looking for teams. They're looking for athletes. And as long as you play, a schedule that allows you to be seen, meaning like that national to open schedule, you're going to have opportunities to have college coaches see you, right? So they're not looking for the team, they're looking for an individual player. And that to me, you should, your number one should always be, who's my coach and how are they going to train, period. Yeah, I think based off of that too, um, I have, now that I'm older, I'm out of college and all that. I have a lot of, um, all my contacts now are mostly either still playing or in the coaching world. And a lot of the times it's, you know, not the 17 or 18 year old that can like hit the 10 foot line that has just like an arm, like an elbow swing or when they're facing the net, it's like, oh my gosh, I saw this 13 year old today. That was so dynamic, you know, and it's, it's okay. Like if you're making mistakes at the beginning, especially with your younger athletes, 
um, because it comes over time. But if someone can see like that athletic potential from a young age and it's like, okay, I can do something with that, right? Or, oh, I, I can see them develop more. Um, so I think it's it's just worth, worth the time um, and effort to put into this for those steps if um, you do have athletes that do want to play collegiately, but also for the health of the shoulder and the body as well. Two questions here. Somebody asked to post the clinic information. I just did. It's in the chat. So that will take you to our website. That'll show you the clinic this weekend. Um, that'll show you the clinic in July as well. And then somebody else asked, you host clinics elsewhere? Yes. Um, we've done that in 2019, before the 2020 shutdown, I probably did 22 clinics across the country, right, in, in a lot of different states. We will go wherever the club or the athletes are. We need typically 20 athletes for us to go do that. Um, but if you reach out to us, if you're a club, if you're a coach and want to host, we need a facility and we need, you know, obviously uh, access to the parents and athletes, and we're happy to go do that. For the most part, right now, this summer, we're doing just, I live in Fort Collins, Colorado. We're doing two clinics here because that's where I'm at. Um, Nicole's here. And so that's where we're doing them right now. And um, if you're interested in hosting us, having us come there, we'd love to do it. Um, so just, just let us know. Awesome. Well, I'm going to go ahead and close. I appreciate everybody's time and questions. Once again, if you have other questions, comments, there's a lot to this. Um, there's a lot we do. It's We're happy to share a lot of it. Just reach out to us, reach out to me, Kelly, Nicole, whatever. That's a good starting point. Uh, we're happy to share with you guys and uh, go from there. Appreciate your time. Appreciate your questions. Kelly, Jess, Nicole, all you guys appreciate it. And every, all you guys out there attending, thanks for your time. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Take care. Talk soon.